Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Genome Imaging of Head and Neck Solid Tumors, Oropharyngeal, Tongue, and Thyroid Cancers. I'm Christy Jewell of Laberts and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by BioNano Genomics. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit bionanogenomics.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or you can use the ask a question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. Today's presentation is educational and it offers continuing education credits. After this presentation, click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to present today's speaker, Dr. Brandon Labarge. Dr. Labarge is an otolaryngology head and neck surgery resident at the Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Welcome, Dr. Labarge. You may now begin your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction there. Um, today I'll be presenting on the number of uh, head and neck solid tumors using bionano genome imaging. Uh, beginning with an overview, I'll start talking with a a discussion of the solid tissue high molecular weight DNA isolation protocol uh, that BioNano has recently developed. I'll go over the BioNano platform in general, and then I'll move to a number of head and neck cancers, including tongue, anaplastic thyroid, and HPV, HPV positive oral pharyngeal cancer, and then wrap up with some conclusions. So the BioNano SP tissue DNA isolation protocol utilizes a nano bind disk to bind the DNA um, without shearing the DNA in any way, allowing you to obtain high molecular weight DNA, which is at least 150,000 base pair in length. Uh, it also uses a, a magnetic tube rack in order to bind the disc, which is paramagnetic to the wall, and so that you can do easy uh, buffer washing steps as well. And so this begins with approximately 10 milligrams of solid tissue that's minced and then blended. Uh, I use a collagen tissue rupture for that. And then um, in stark comparison to previous protocols, which used the agarose plug method, um, this, was, this has been vastly improved. Uh, the previous method, you would embed the DNA uh, inside an agarose plug for many washing and digestion steps, which would take place over a number of days, typically at least three or so. Um, and I could process maybe four samples during that time, and I was lucky if maybe three quarters of them were successful. And then running them on the machine, I would sometimes get 100x coverage. Sometimes I would get lucky and get closer to 300, but this new improved protocol, in about five hours, I can process about six samples, starting from solid tissue, taking it all the way to ultra high molecular weight DNA, and easily obtain greater than 300x coverage of the genome. Uh, so after the blending process, it's the sample is passed through a 40 micrometer filter, pelleted, washed, followed by uh, a lysine and proteinase K digestion, and then you add the nanobind disk which binds the DNA, and you can see the image to the right, it's kind of how the DNA appears. It's kind of this wispy, cotton-like substance that falls from the disc. And there are numerous inversion steps um, in order to improve binding of the DNA to the disc, uh, including many uh, washing steps as well. And then after elution, you're done, and then the process is pretty simple overall. Moving on to the Bio Nano gen Genome Imaging Platform, after the isolation step, which is the uh, SP, which is solution phase, the DNA is then labeled using DLS, direct label staining. Uh, they have a DLE enzyme, which sta stains the DNA at, at a six base pair sequence motif that repeats throughout the human genome. And so by doing this, it creates a kind of molecular barcode on the DNA. Then you take this DNA and load it on a sapphire chip. So you can see the bottom right what these kind of look like. You can load three samples on a single chip. 
They're then loaded onto the Brand Owner Sapphire instrument, which you can see on the bottom left, which then takes multiple images of the DNA as it passes through and repeated cycling to scan the genome. Algorithms then convert these images into digital molecules, which are overlapped to create consensus genome maps of your sample, which are then compared to a reference, like the HG38 human reference, in order to detect structural variants like insertions, deletions, translocations. You can see the labeling based on the staining of these kind of lines that you see. Here's a schematic of the sapphire chip. So the DNA is loaded in and it becomes untangled in the pillars and then becomes linearized in the nanochannels. And so you can see in the bottom left how DNA is kind of coiled up when it's in free in solution. And with that, but passing through this chip, uh, it's able to become linearized. And then on the right side, you can see what it actually looks like when the samples are being run in the sapphire instrument. You can see that the DNA in general is being labeled in this blue. And you have these very long strands. Again, this is a high molecular weight DNA. And then the, the green dots are where the DNA has been stained using the uh, DLE to create this kind of molecular barcode that, that we can then load an image multiple times to create something like this. And so the sample, so the cancel sample, for, for example, is shown in blue. And the different the lines on the, the blue are the staining pattern. Um, and then you can see that in green is the reference. So for, for what I do, it's typically HD38, also has the banding pattern. And any differences that are detected can be used to, to decide uh, the presence of structural variants. And all the images you're seeing on the bottom there in orange are just examples of these digital molecules that span the region. This is a little closer view of how the structural variants are called by comparing the label patterns. And you can see, for example, on the top left, how a deletion looks. So you see there's banding on the green human reference. And then compared to the cancer sample, for example, in blue, there's a region there that, that's now missing. And so that's where the deletion has occurred. And you can see similarly for insertion um, between those two regions where we used to have bands, there's now an additional band and an additional uh, DNA. So that's what we call an insertion. And it's this type of method to call these different structural variants. Now, translocation, for example, the top green refers to a given chromosome, and the bottom green can refer to a different chromosome, for example, even the same. So that's what we call the de novo pipeline, because you're building a reference. You're building a genome de novo based on just overlaps of your molecules, and then you compare it to a reference genome. So you build it de novo first and then compare. We have another pipeline called the Vervarian pipeline um, that does not create a de novo assembly, but instead directly compares the digital molecules to a reference genome, so like HG38. And this allows for detection of SCs at a smaller allele fraction down to 5%. But it may miss smaller events like some insertions, deletions that may be picked up better at de novo. Now, the Vervarian pipeline does require approximately 300x coverage of the reference compared to about 80x for de novo. Um, with the SC tissue DNA isolation, I'm pretty easy now to obtain at least 300 X with these samples. So I can kind of go through both pipelines and see the results. Moving on now to tongue cancer. The traditional risk factors for tongue cancer, which is predominantly squamous cell carcinoma, include smoking and alcohol. And so because of this, patients tend to be a bit older in the 60s, 70s, and have long histories of smoking and drinking. However, it's been noted in the literature that there's an increase in oral cavity cancers, which include tongue, and those less than 45 years old. And these are theorized to be mostly females who really don't have the traditional risk factors like smoking and drinking. But a question that's been raised is that is if these tongue cancers in these young patients is genetically different than in elderly patients with the traditional risk factors. And this, of course, could have implications for uh, different diagnostic, prognostic, and treatment method, uh, methodologies. So taking a close look at the literature on the mutational profile between these young and elderly tongue cancers, some reports that are based on short read sequencing tend to reach the conclusion that the profiles are overall pretty similar. However, some, in particular with P53, cite more or less mutations in the young cohort, but there's not a clear pattern overall. There's also not a clear cutoff for when young and old is used in studies. It's generally been recommend, uh, recommended now to use less than 30 for young, although the frequency of these tumors is quite rare, and that can be a challenge in itself. 
But in general, the literature is kind of conflicting on whether there's a difference. And so the question I wanted to ask is if I could use optical mapping with BioNano uh, to help us identify large complex structural variants that may differ between young and elderly tongue cancer. Uh, sequencing is quite good at detecting smaller events, but for larger and more complex structural variants, it can sometimes miss them or be hard to interpret them. And so using this different technology, we can get a different view of the cancer. And perhaps we can identify genetic drivers that can improve our therapies. And so for the genome imaging from BioNano that I'll show, these are using a rare variant pipeline, so again, about 300x coverage. And I use the HD38 reference genome. And for these, I'm using a filter of the BioNano controls to, to view ones that are, to view structural variants that are not present in any of the controls I have. Here's the first tongue cancer that I'm showing. This is an elderly patient, so 60 years old, square muscle carcinoma. So carcinoma. And this is mostly uh, insertion deletions. And first, I'd like to just go over what we see on the left image here. So this is a circos plot, which is the um, description of the BioNano data. And so on the outside, we can see that numbered from 1 to 24 are the chrom different chromosomes. Beneath that, we see the chromosomal banding pattern. And then in the box below that, we see where the structural variants are located. And these are all color-coded. And so you can see on the top right, this box here, different colors correspond to different uh, structural variants like insertions, deletions, et cetera. So insertions are shown in this kind of dark green. And what you can see on chromosome 1, for example, there's three different insertions. And then on chromosome 3, there's a deletion in that region. And any of these structural variants within the software, you can click on them, and then you get taken to a map to view it in more detail. Uh, below that box where the structural variants are, you can see this line that's kind of plotted across. And this is where copy number variation is plotted. And so for this sample, the copy number is not very variable. Uh, it goes around, it's mostly pretty stable. Uh, you can see on chromosome 22, there's these small little red bands going down. That indicates a loss of copy number in that area. In contrast, on 23, for example, is a small blue tick up, and that would be an increase in copy number. But overall, not much uh, copy number variation for this sample. Within the center, we see where different translocations are being shown. Uh, for example, you can see between chromosomes 6 and 7 as a translocation. And again, you can click on these events as well for a closer view. Uh, so overall, for this elderly tongue cancer, mostly insertion solutions, a few translocations, duplications, uh, not much in terms of copy number variation. If I take a closer look at the different genes that are involved in these structural variations, I see that it affects a, quite a different number of pathways. And so, for example, there's a deletion in the CNK SR1 gene, which regulates RAS, signal, RAS, RAS signaling. Now you see a translocation involving CDK6, which promotes the G1S transition. Insertions affecting uh, different RASA genes involved in the RAS map kinase pathway, as well as a deletion in the apobec 3 f gene, uh, which is involved in uh, DNA deaminase, which has been implicated recently in literature for head and neck cancer. And there's also different gene fusions that are being uh, detected. So there's one in particular involving a translocation that involves rat d one b which is uh, involved in Belgian DNA repair. So here's how the different structural variants look um, using genome Im imaging. And so on the very top, you can see the chromosomal banding. And then below that is where copy number is populated with a green line. So generally here, we're not seeing too much copy number variation. Uh, beneath that, you see this kind of uh, purple bar that indicates the different genes. And this is using HG38. So this gene here we're seeing is CDK6. And then the light blue bar is the young, the uh, elderly tongue cancer genome that we created using the uh, rare variant pipeline. And so you can see again the bands that are located on the genome, which is after staining with the uh, DLE. We create that kind of molecular barcode and it's being compared to the green, which is the reference. And so on top, we see chromosome 7. And we see that most of the bandings on the left side are matching up. But then once we get towards kind of the middle of the screen, the banding starts to line up with chromosome 18. And so what we're seeing here then is a translocation. And as well on chromosome 18, it also looks like there's a inversion as well. Here we see the same cancer now. This is what the deletion in April back through that looks like. And so again, we can see a region of banding on the green HG38 reference for chromosome 22 that is lost now for our tongue cancer, indicating a deletion. And if you look, the 
on the tongue cancer genome, uh, which is in the pale blue there, there's a darker blue line which indicates the coverage for that area. And so, for example, where this deletion happens, there's actually very quite high coverage that supports that read. We go now to the rat 51 b translocation. Uh, you can see similar here the chromosome 14 and chromosome 7. This is translocation of that for this tongue cancer. And you're also able to view the individual digital molecules themselves to see how it supports the structural variant. And so all these kind of yellow lines on the bottom here are individual digital molecules. And you can see that there are a number of them that span this region uh, between these two different chromosomes supporting this translocation call. Here is another elderly tongue cancer. This patient was 63. Again, squamous cell carcinoma. A pretty similar story to the previous um, cancer, mostly insertion deletions, although this one has a bit more duplications, translocations as well. So moderate copy number variation. Um, you can see, for example, on chromosome three, this region here where the blue upticks outwards from the circle and an increase in copy number. And chromosome nine, for example, you can see some loss of copy number with the red lines going down. Looking at the genes for this sample, uh, we can again see a variety of different pathways involved. There's a duplication that involves the RAS5 gene or the RAS domain. Uh, a duplication in the WENT2 gene, uh, which of course is a transcription, transcription factor activator. And then we have a uh, translocation that involves CCND2 involved in the D2 CDK4 complex in inhibits RB. Moving on now to some of these younger tongue cancer patients. So this is squamous cell carcinoma the tongue of a 26-year-old. And we can see that they have quite a bit more insertions deletions, particularly deletions, compared to the two previous elderly cases. Um, and then copy number for this is pretty moderate as well. So for three, you can see regions there uh, where the blue is upticking, showing increased copy number variation. Now, this patient has quite a large variety of uh, structural variants. Uh, we can see there's a deletion in AKT3, cell signal regulator, a translocation involving BRAS, uh, involved in MAP kinase signaling, and also resulting in gene fusion. A translocation that involves BCL2, L1, involved in apoptosis, as well as insertion in tau k 3 which is an activator of MAP kinase, a deletion in STK24, which is involved in MAP kinase pathway. Uh, and insertion in NLK, which is involved in wind signaling. The next young tongue cancer patient is a 34-year-old, and this one has a quite rich number of deletions that you can see. So again, in, in that orange color, and you can see them being populated throughout the genome, so in chromosome 2 and 3, and throughout, you see many, many deletions. Um, and there's also a significant number of increase in copy number, so I say in chromosome 3 and 4 that we're seeing. For this patient, um, we again see involvement in different pathways. Um, so it includes a deletion in FHIT, which is involved in apoptosis, uh, inversion duplication involving uh, MAP4K2, MAP uh, kinase signaling, a duplication involving RIAGB, modern RAS signaling. So if you look at these two young tongue cancers and compare them to the two elderly, you can notice a trend in different pathways that are involved. Of course, we're comparing too young versus too elderly, so it's not a quite a large uh, comparison yet, but there's already some things you can start to take away. And so for the young patients, we can see that the MAP kinase pathway is heavily involved in both of these patients. Um, and then we can see apoptosis as well is affected in both pathways predominantly, as well as wind signaling. On the elderly side, in comparison, we have involvement at the level of RAS, as well as the G1S transition although one of these also does involve uh, the wind signaling as well. Although genes that I underlined are ones that are implicated in some literature that support uh, a difference between young and elderly. So the underlined ones are hypothesized to be more involved with young tongue cancer. And so even just between this early comparison here, we can see that this holds up so far, that most of these genes that they've been identified are supported by the genome imaging of BioNano. And so we can further isolate more patients and um, follow up on these results to see if this holds true, as well as to look for other trends that perhaps are missed with traditional sequencing because we're able to use such larger pieces of DNA.
Here's another look at just some of the different genes that are involved in young versus elderly. So again, in young, we have involved with BRAS, BCL2 of apoptosis, uh, compared to more RAS signaling on the elderly side. Here's a brief description of the different structural variants between the, the two young versus two elderly patients. Now, at the bottom, I sum them up, and the biggest uh, notable finding is that the deletions are so much larger in frequency for the younger patients. So almost more than two uh, times the count of deletions in the young population, as well as more duplications as well, although the one elderly tongue, can tongue cancer only had five duplications, so perhaps that's an outlier. Um, but anyway, things to follow up on for future uh, future uh, isolations. And perhaps there's more copy number variation as well in these younger cases. This is a, a brief chart review that I did for these two these two patients in each, in each group. What I want to point out is that the smoking history for these young patients, one that was 26 and one that was 34, is non-existent. There's no smoking history and very little alcohol use. And so these are the traditional risk factors again for tongue cancer. And these patients don't have that, and they're quite young as well. In comparison, these elderly patients, which are at least 60, have 40 pack years smoking uh, and a bit more alcohol exposure. So that difference is one of the main reasons why we're interested in pursuing this comparison between tongue cancer according to age. The other difference that stands out, at least at this stage, is that the differentiation of these cancers for the young patients is a bit more well differentiated. Uh, in comparison for the older patients, it's more moderate or poorly differentiated. In the future, I'd like to pursue this with some more um, more patients and see if these trends hold up and what other patterns we can identify. What we can see is perhaps the, we're seeing consistently more deletions duplications among this younger cohort, if there's more copy number variation, that they're more likely to be well differentiated. Again, that's a conflicting point in the literature, whether these tongue cancers among the young or or better or worse prognostically. It's unclear right now if these patients are, are better off or if they uh, fare worse than these elderly patients. So it's certainly something that I'm excited to pursue further. The next cancer, this is anaplastic thyroid. So this is undifferentiated thyroid cancer. It accounts for a pretty small proportion of thyroid cancers globally, as well as 1% or up to 10%. Tend to be older, about 65, and predominantly female. And if note, this has very rapid regression, poor treatment outcome, and mortality basically approaches 100% for these patients. They, they fare quite poorly, and their, their breathing is disrupted quite early in the disease state. And so I'm interested in taking a look at these highly aggressive cancers and seeing what we can see um, using genome imaging. This hasn't been applied before. So looking at this patient, um, we can see a variety of insertion deletions, some modest uh, copy number variation on chromosome 17, for example, a, reason, a region of increase and another region of decrease, and a few translocations involving chromosomes 1, 2, and 7. Looking at the genes involved here, you can see there's an insertion involved in the PRK, CZ gene involved in PKC signaling, um, and duplication involved in ABR gene involved in GTPase activation. The next thyroid patient also has a number of different insertions and deletions that are detected. Not much in the way of copy number variation, and one translocation between 4 and 10. So this patient had an insertion in CDK11B involved in cell cycle control, as well as an insertion of the ABR gene, uh, a duplication involving CDK12 transcription regulation, which resulted in a gene fusion. Here's where the uh, CDH1 insertion looks. You can see that the the blue representing the cancer has a region here um, that's been increased, and that's resulting in this insertion compared to the reference genome. And you can see that the molecules below that support this event are quite rich spinning this region, so there's a lot of support putting it to this seed. Final anaplastic thyroid cancer example is here. Of note, this one has very extensive loss of copy number variation. So you can see all these red bands all across the genome indicating loss of copy number, which is quite interesting. And again, again this has uh, predominantly insertion deletions, as well as a couple of translocations involving uh, chromosome 1 in particular. Taking a closer look at these genes, we can see there's an insertion in the CCNL2 gene uh, involved in cyclin transcription regulation, as, as well as a duplication involving RAD18 uh, ubiquitin protein ligase. 
And one of the ways we can further analyze data using genome imaging is to apply different beta mask files. And so one potential file um, identifies structural variants that are involved in different kinases. And so this can represent potential drug targets. And so I pulled uh, some of the findings for these different cancers so far. And I noted the potential targets, so these are different kinases that are involved. And then you can look and see in the literature whether there are drugs that then target that, for example. So for the first thyroid patient, they had a AAK1 uh, structural variant, and that can be targeted using sinitinib or lotinib, for example. And so something like this is a pretty easy way to analyze your samples to see what potential drug targets there could be and can lead to further investigation. Moving on now to human papillomavirus. Uh, this is a double-stranded circular uh, DNA virus. It's notable for having um, two viral oncoproteins, E6 and E7, that are thought to be pretty critical for its role in, in cancer development. So E7 disrupts RB, and E6 disrupts P53. Now, HPV is notable for being involved in cervical cancer, but also in head and neck cancer. For head and neck, we notice that it's predominantly HPV-16, although there's a smaller proportion of other subtypes like HPV-33. So head and neck cancer of the oropharynx, which is essentially the middle throat, we think predominantly tonsils and base of tongue. It's quite different depending on whether it's a classic form, basically non-HPV, and whether it's HPV-induced. So the classic form tends to be elderly patients, 60 in their 60s and 70s, and predominantly associated with risk factors like smoking and alcohol. And they tend to have pretty high mortality and some sensitivity to chemo radiation. In comparison, HPV-induced squamous cell carcinoma, the oropharynx, they tend to be younger, so in their 40s and 50s. And again, affects lymphoid tissue, so that's tonsil, base of tongue. Mortality is lower, and they tend to have higher sensitivity to chemo radiation. Although it's unclear why there are certain patients that don't respond quite as well. Now, oropharyngeal cancer in the United States overall has been increasing in recent decades, and it's been driven by HPV-positive cancer. Uh, in the graph to the right, we can see that in the, the black circles show HPV-negative oropharynx. So that would be the traditional classic form of squamous cell carcinoma in this region, attributable smoking and alcohol. And that's been declining largely because of uh, decreasing smoking rates in the United States. Over the blue line, it represents HPV-positive disease, which has been increasing steadily and it has increased uh, to the current day. And so we're looking at HPV and these head and neck cancers and we're realizing that there are three main forms that are described in the literature, mostly um, hypothetically. There hasn't been super detailed evidence for this. Uh, so the HPV can be integrated into the human genome, can exist as a viral episome, so that's separate from the human genome, kind of as a ring it's thought to be, or a viral human hybrid episome. And so it's some type of ring form that includes human DNA, perhaps integrates and pops out or something along those lines. It's also been described that integration can disrupt the viral E1, E2 gene, and of note, E2 is a viral repressor for E6 and E7, which were those viral oncoproteins I noted before. And so therefore, it's hypothesized that the integrated form has increased E6, E7 activity, which can lead to increased genomic instability and cancer formation. So perhaps these patients are fair, uh, poor when they have this integrated form. And what, what, uh, much of what we know about HPV, HPV's role in cancer is from cerebral cancer, where a very large portion of it is of uh, HPV is integrated. I thought that in head and neck, there might be a larger portion that is um, episomal, so, although still mostly integrated, thought to be, but the episomal form is thought to be more involved. So our question was whether we could combine optical mapping using BioNano as well as whole genome sequencing uh, using Illumina platform to characterize the molecular state of HPV in head and neck cancer, so whether it's integrated, episomal, and the implication of this research is that we can develop a platform to identify and describe the molecular state of HPV in these head and neck cancers, and perhaps associated with patient outcomes, we might be able to improve our treatment plans uh, for patients who might need more aggressive therapy or patients who might need uh, a little bit less and so then can have uh, less morbidity. Now, for comparison, whole genome sequencing and uh, optical mapping with BioNano, you can see that whole genome sequencing is better at detecting smaller mutations, so less than 50 base pairs, single base pair mutations. And this, of course, is based on relatively small DNA fragments, often less than 500 base pairs. 
Comparison by Nano uses DNA segments that are at least 150,000 days per in length. But because of that, it's much better at detecting these large and complex structural variants. And so because sequencing is better at these smaller events and BioNano is better at these larger events, we're going to use both uh, in, our, in our approach. Here's an example of a base of tongue cancer that's HPV positive. And again, we're looking at the circle spot, chromosomal banding pattern underneath that, we have the structural variants that are color coded. And then beneath that, we have the copy number variation and the translocation shown in the middle. Now looking at the whole genome sequencing of this, uh, this is mapping actually to the HPV33 reference. So although it only accounts for about 10-11% of these cancers, uh, we found one here. And we noted that there are chimeric reads, so these reads that map both to viral and human, they integrate, that indicate integration into the human genome in this region. Now, based on those sequencing coordinates, we can then go back to the BioNano and look at what this event um, looks like in, in very close detail. And so we can see, for example, on the top, we see the HG38 human reference. And beneath that is our tumor genome. And these are created using the de novo pipeline. And we can see that in this region here, the HPV33 virus inserts itself. And then there's a duplication event that includes the virus and the surrounding region of the genome. They create this new segment. So by combining the sequencing platform along with BioNano, we can come up with data like this, which is quite interesting to see. The same patient had a translocation disrupting the retinoblastoma gene that we can see here, a large region here that gets deleted from the reference and inserted different region. This is a second patient uh, with tonsil cancer. And for this one, we have both tumor and lymph node isolated. And for the bionano, strikingly, there's essentially no structural variants that are detected. So we go to the whole genome sequencing. This one, in fact, maps to the HPV-16 reference. And we can note that there's 19 copies of the virus per cell, but there are no chimeric reads, indicating that the virus is not integrated in the sample. In the region between the red arrows, you can see it's some areas of decreased mapping to the HPV reference, um, but there's no chimeric reads, and so it's not integrated, and so that we therefore think that this is more likely to be an episomal form. This third example uh, is a tonsil cancer. Uh, now this one, has a number of uh, different structural variants, so deletions, for example, on chromosomes 10, 11, 12, and a variety of different translocations. Some moderate uh, copy number variation as well. For the whole genome sequencing for this, you can notice these uh, two regions here with these uh, decreased mapping. And these are actually where there are chromatic reads that are detected. Uh, this is HPV16 coverage. And we can use these integration positions based on the sequencing to line it up to the structural variant that we see using genome imaging with BioNano. And we can see that there's a region here where the virus is presumed to be inserted based on sequencing. Now we can see that an insertion happened, so where the red arrow is. And we can see actually that this kind of repeats itself multiple times in the region as well. And so again, by combining both platforms, we're able to get kind of detail that you can't really obtain with other technology alone. And the last example here is another tonsil cancer. And again, for this one, we we'll see no structural variants. And so if it fits the paradigm from before, we expect to go to sequencing and notice that we don't see any chimeric reads. And so that would be more indicative of episomal form. And so for these episomal cancers, because they don't really have these structural variants or optical mapping, we're, more, we're interested in looking at the sequencing data further to identify different SNPs involved in different uh, cell pathways. So of note, what we've seen so far, and this has been extended to about a dozen more samples, is that for samples that we can identify integrated events with sequencing, we find this kind of global genomic instability for these HPV cancers um, using the genome imaging. But if we still find a sequencing event and it matches up with these um, genome maps where there's not really many structural variants, so it seems to, to suggest that these integrated forms have greater genomic instability than the episomal. If you look at the clinical info between these groups, we, we can take note of a number of dis differences. So the integrated HPV cancers tend to be a bit more advanced in stage and are associated with more um, disease recurrence as well. The mean tumor size is, is quite a bit bigger in these integrated forms, 3.4 centimeters compared to 2.5 cryptosomal, as well as uh, larger metastatic focus in lymph nodes. Now, perineural invasion and lymphovascular invasion um, are signs that the cancer has invaded into either nerve or, or vessel and are associated with 
poor prognosis, and these are also more associated in these integrated forms. So by combining optical mapping of genome imaging from BioNano uh, with whole genome sequencing, we can detect the state of these HPV genomes ahead of cancer. And we noticed with the integrated forms, they have greater genomic instability, and they have worse clinical outcomes. So perhaps these integra integration status of HPV can become more important for cancer treatment planning going forward. A genome imaging is able to construct these complicated genomic alterations that were previously un unidentifiable using whole genome sequencing alone. So we've had a lot of success studying these by combining, uh, combining both platforms. So in conclusion, these solution phase cell tissue high molecular weight genome isolation protocol uh, re re uh, recently developed from BioNano is highly efficient, easy to follow, much improved compared to the previous agarose plug method. Um, and by combining it with the latest Sapphire instrument and check technology, you can reliably reach greater than 300x genome coverage for these solid tumors. And I've been able to successfully apply this framework to a variety of head and neck cancers. Now, so for tongue cancer, there's some early results that suggest possible genetic differences between young and elderly tongue cancer. I'm able to identify a variety of structural variants in highly lethal anaplastic thyroid cancer. And in conjunction with whole genome sequencing, I've been able to identify HPV insertion sites in association with high genomic instability with uh, HPV integration. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Broach, Dr. Goldenberg, as well as BioNano for their support. I have some references here. Now I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Dr. Labarge. It is now time for our live Q&A session of our webinar. Now, before we dive in, I just want to remind our audience how to submit questions. If you have a question you'd like to ask, do it now, and just type them into the Ask a Question box on the far left of your screen, click Send, and we will get to as many questions as we have time for. OK, let's dive in. Dr. Labarge, let's start with this question. Can you start looking for events that are cancer drivers, initiation of cancer, not result of cancer. Yes, definitely. And that's, that's something we're, of course, considering. Um, at this stage, we've mostly been working with cancers that have already formed. And so it's hard to look at the initiation stage. Although if we were able to um, study, for example, some type of model, perhaps a cell line, we had different stages uh, known stages of uh, cancer development. For example, if you have a uh, HPV uh, cell line, and then you can see that uh, you can monitor the progress to see basically where the cancer develops. And then if you use these type of platforms, you can try to see when it happens or what kind of events are happening before then. Now, Dr. Labarge, for tongue cancer, you explain the differences between older and younger cases very clearly. Can you explain why you think that is? What is the cause of the differences? And are these lifestyle or genetic differences that cause early or late onset? So the why is what we're trying to figure out. And it's not really clear why the, why the difference is there. Um, as far as lifestyle, the traditional risk factors, smoking, alcohol, aren't there for these younger patients, typically, and at least not there for the type of period that the elderly patients are experiencing them. So it's less clear of what lifestyle interaction could be used behind that. As far as genetic differences, uh, these two young, uh, young tongue cancer patients did not have any family history of, of cancer like that. So it's, it's unclear then what the genetic difference could be. Um, but that's something that we're looking into. And it's been noted that there are different um, gene pathways that, are type to, that tend to be involved for young versus elderly, although it's conflicting. And we're able to replicate some of that with this genome imaging. And I want to look into that more going forward. Thank you. When structural vari variants are subclonal, do you get data on which variants occur together in the same cells? I don't, I don't think that information is accessible um, based on gen genome imaging alone, as far as I know. Thank you. How much does it cost to analyze a genome with optical map, optical mapping, roughly? In my experience, it's about $400 or so uh, per genome for optical optical mapping. In my experience with sequencing has been that it takes that it's more closer to $1,500 or so per sample, and so the the price point is is um, 
it's definitely in five nine's favor for that. Thank you. Now, Dr. Labarge, have you tried calling structural variants based on the whole genome sequence data? We are looking into that, um, particularly for the, those HPV samples to see what variants we can call by whole genome sequencing. And then we're going to follow that up by comparing to the optical mapping to see how much overlap there is or if there is different types of SVs that we're detecting the different platforms. Thank you. Now we have time for a few more questions, but I do want to let our audience know that any questions we are unable to answer today due to time restraints, they will be answered via the email address you provided at the time of registration. Okay, let's squeeze in a few more. Now, Dr. Labarge, if I understand correctly, you used a set of common SVs to retain only rare SVs occurring in the patients. How many genomes were used to build the set of common SVs and which genomes did you use? Did you sequence non-tumoral tissue from the same patients? So for the tongue and thyroid patients, I did not do any sequencing. Um, but for those, I did use the rare variant pipeline, which I think you're um, alluding to. So that pipeline is able to detect variants that ha can happen at low frequency, say 5%, but it's not limited to only detecting rare structural variants. And so each of those tumors, I was able to generate a genome for each one um, and then compare that to the reference to determine uh, different structural variants. Thank you. And Dr. Lobarge, we have time for one more question. Can CRISPR techniques help in finding a cure for cancers caused due to genetic mutation or through heredity? Yes, I think there's great potential um, with using CRISPR for this for this uh, purpose. I think for, for optical mapping in particular, it can be helpful. For example, if we're able to determine a way to CRISPR label HIV-16 virus, then we can um, label these tumors and then see exactly what the virus is quite easily. And then based on that, we can uh, study it more closely and perhaps not rely on the sequencing to determine what the virus is and it can kind of speed on the process. But I think it definitely has a great potential and can be applied to different viruses that are oncogenic in nature as well. Thank you, Dr. Labarge. And thank you for this excellent Q&A session. You've given us a lot of information. Do you have any final comments for our audience? I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. I uh, appreciate you spending your time taking a listen. And um, just wanted to reiterate that my experience using the platform has been um, quite promising so far for a variety of head and neck tumors. And the SP tissue in particular protocol has made isolation so much easier than the, the previous agarose plug methods. So if you have solid tissue tumors that you're interested in, it's definitely something to look into. Thank you. And Dr. Labarge, I'm going to pull an audible real quick, and I want to throw in one more question that came in. I think this is a great one. How were the structural variants filtered, and what pipeline was used? So for tongue and thyroid, I used the rare variant pipeline um, because with the SB tissue, I was able to achieve greater coverage of the reference. So with 300X, I can then use that rare variant pipeline and see the types of variants are there, including ones that are quite rare which you might miss with lower coverage. Uh, the filtering for those, I used the most stringent settings possible for the um, Bionauta control. So Bionauta has reference genomes that they have, and you, you can set it so basically any structural variants that you see are not present in any of the Bionauta controls, and that's what I use for those. Uh, for the HPV data, those were done a bit, uh, a bit older using the agarose plug method. And so for those, I used the de novo pipeline because that's what existed at the time. And plus, I was getting around 100x because of the agarose plug method. Although, if I had used SV tissue, which is now available, I, think might, I might be able to get 300x. And on some of them, I did reach higher levels um, and applied that to the rare variant as well. And in those cases, um, I actually also filtered out by the patient blood any germline mutations just, just to see what was somatic for those HPV ones. Thank you so much, and thank you for your time today and your important research. I also want to thank LabRoots, and I want to thank our sponsor, BioNanoGenomics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. 
Now, before we go, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and again for their interesting questions. We have quite a few questions we are unable to answer today. So those questions that came in today and we weren't able to answer, and additionally those that are submitted during our on-demand period, they will be addressed by Dr. Labarge via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. One more thank you to Dr. Brandon Labarge, and we thank you for joining us. Today's webcast can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. We thank you for joining us. Stay healthy, stay safe, and have a great day.